True crime stories have dominated the press in recent months. Some corners of the world have obscure true crime stories that you might never have heard of in your part of the world. There are other crazy true crimes that sound fake but are real. Number 5 24-year-old Erin Marie Gilbert had the world at her feet. The promising young woman had moved to Anchorage, Alaska from San Francisco, California the year before at her sister's request. Erin quickly settled into life in Alaska and began making friends and turning heads wherever she went. Neither Erin nor her family ever believed that she would be at the center of one of Alaska's most bizarre missing person cases that you'll never believe. Before her disappearance, Erin had enrolled in beauty school and was excited about the upcoming academic year. Standing at almost six feet tall, Erin loved to play basketball and was described as a responsible and kind young woman. She also liked to let her hair down and dress up and hit the local bars. On June 30th, 1995, Erin was drinking at a bar when she met David Combs. The pair immediately hit it off and agreed to go on a date the next day. July 1st, 1995 rolled around and Erin was excited for her date. At the time, she was living with her sister and her husband at their house while she worked part-time as a nanny. David arrived at the home to collect Erin and as she left, her nephew said, Auntie Erin, you should bring a cell phone. To which Erin replied, no, that's okay a detail that would go on to haunt Aaron's sister, Stephanie. The pair drove up to the Girdwood Forest Fair in Girdwood, Alaska and walked around, looking at the stalls and taking in the natural beauty of the forests around them. Witnesses recalled seeing Aaron and David in a beer garden at the fair and David told investigators that they left at around 6 p.m. to go back to his car. When they arrived at his car, they found that the headlights had been left on which had drained the battery. David told Aaron that he would walk to a friend's house nearby to get help and that he would be back very soon. Two hours passed and David found himself walking up and down looking for his friend's house. In the end, he gave up his search and returned to his car. When David returned, he was shocked to find that his car miraculously started even though it had a dead battery. He was also shocked to find that Erin had disappeared and there was no sign of her anywhere. Thinking that perhaps she'd gone back into the fair to kill some time, he searched for her until around 1 a.m. before calling it quits and heading back home. The next morning, David phoned Erin's sister, Stephanie, to ask if she had gotten home okay. But to his horror, Stephanie hadn't seen or heard from Erin since the night before. Realizing that something was very wrong, Stephanie and other family members went down to the fairgrounds to search for Aaron, but found nothing. Eventually, the Alaska State Troopers were called to the scene and a missing person investigation was officially opened. Search dogs, helicopters, search and rescue, and volunteers scoured the forests for Aaron, but it was as if she had vanished into thin air. Stephanie told investigators that it was very uncharacteristic for Aaron to go walking in the woods and that there was no reason she could have run away. Months turned into years and despite the best efforts of the Alaska State Troopers, Aaron Gilbert has never been found. David Combs, the man that Aaron was with on the night that she disappeared, is not considered a suspect but her family believes she met with foul play that night. She's described as a white female with short pixie cut brown hair and hazel eyes. She's 5 foot 11 and 145 pounds and has a tattoo of a large blue flower on her chest. Anyone with information is urged to contact the Alaska State Troopers on 907-428-7200 or 907-269-5497. Number 4 59 year old Abby Flynn spent the day of February 2nd, 2020, 
getting everything ready to host a Super Bowl party that evening. Abby and her friends had excitedly discussed the details for weeks, and now their plans were turning into a reality. At around 2.40 p.m., she FaceTimed her son and told him that she was going for a quick walk before the party. This wasn't out of the ordinary for Abby. Her family told NBC that she was a keen hiker and loved walking trails behind her Massachusetts home. On the weekend of the Super Bowl party, her husband, Rich, was out of town and in Texas, leaving Abby to have a fun-filled evening with her friends. When Abby's friends arrived at her home, it was empty. Everything for the party was laid out and ready. The oven was still warm, but there was no sign of their host. Concern grew as her friends searched the neighborhood but found no sign of Abby. Sensing that something was wrong, her friends called the police department and reported her missing. Within minutes, the police had descended on the home and an investigation was open. According to the police department, there was no sign of forced entry and no sign of a struggle in the home, making this one of the strangest true crime stories to recently occur. Abby's phone was left on the kitchen counter and nothing seemed out of place. Now, over a year later, Abby's friends are still wanting answers. Abby Flynn is described as a white female with brown hair and brown eyes. She's 5'5 five five to 5'7 five and 190 to 210 pounds. She was last seen wearing a navy blue L.L. Bean puffer jacket, a long-sleeved flannel shirt, blue jeans, and L.L. Bean boots. If you have any information, you're urged to contact the local police department at 978-283-1212 or the Massachusetts State Police at 978-745-8908. Number 3 The case of Calvin Jones has so many twists and turns that it sounds fake, but we promise it's 100% true. In 1964, 33-year-old Calvin Jones and 23-year-old Sarah Tolbert were in a relationship and going through the highs and lows of any normal adult relationship. On June 13, 1964, the pair were driving in Calvin's car when they got into an explosive argument. The pair exchanged cross words and vented their anger, and in a fit of rage, Calvin pulled out a rubber hose and hit Sarah with it until she was unconscious and eventually passed away from her injuries. Panicked, Calvin drove around for hours, hoping that Sarah would regain consciousness, but she never did. Upon realizing what he had done, he drove himself to the nearest police station and confessed. He was swiftly arrested and held in custody, pending an autopsy and full investigation. The coroner who performed Sarah's autopsy was astounded to find that the attack wasn't the cause of her death at all. Two separate coroners independently concluded that at the time, Sarah had been suffering from sickle cell anemia and that the disease was the cause of her passing, and thus the result was recorded as natural causes. The coroners were unable to provide any evidence that the attack contributed to Sarah's passing, thus absolving him of the crime. Police officers visited Calvin's cell to inform him that his charge had been downgraded for murder and he was now facing an assault case. Everyone involved in this case was baffled by the bizarre and unusual outcome. In 1966, Calvin entered a guilty plea to assault charges and narrowly escaped more serious charges thanks to the autopsy. The judge presiding over Calvin's case addressed the court saying, were it not for the medical reports, this man would have been facing a murder trial today. Number 2 Ghislaine de Vedrine came from a very successful and affluent family. She was the director of a school in Paris. Her oldest brother, Felipe, was an executive with Shell Oil, and her other brother, Charles Henry, was a local politician and gynecologist. The de Vedrine family all lived under one roof in Chateau Martel in France. The chateau had been passed down through generations of the de Vedrines, 
and to say it was beautiful would be an understatement. In the 1990s, Ghislaine met Thierry Tilly when he began working as an administrator at the school. At first, he became Ghislaine's friend, and as time went on, he gained the family's trust. Jean Marchand told BBC News, quote, At the beginning, Tilly said he would look after our home, investments, and trusts. We just wanted to protect them. We used professionals, but he made us believe he was better than them. Unbeknownst to the David Dream family, Thierry was slowly gaining control over them. He was able to whip the family up into a frenzy and kept them in a cult-like state for over 10 years. Ghislaine would soon grow to regret her decision, but at this point, it was simply too late. Thierry's control started subtly, but he began telling the family that they were in the center of a bizarre Masonic conspiracy and that he was their only hope. He began convincing the family to barricade themselves inside of the Chateau Martel and encourage them to cut off contact with the outside world to keep them safe. Thierry threatened the family, telling them that if they went outside or interacted with anyone except each other, that their lives would be in jeopardy. Members of the Davidrine family who were under Thierry's spell described him as hypnotic and very convincing. Thierry's behavior only intensified, and he managed to convince the family to stop paying their taxes and to sell off some of their properties. All of the proceeds from these sales went to Thierry, as he was the one in charge of the family's finances. In 2007, the French authorities noticed that the David Dreens hadn't been paying their taxes, and after a dispute, the Chateau Martel's furniture was removed and auctioned. Some articles also mentioned that Thierry convinced the family to sell the historic family home and gained around $5 million doing so. Following the sale of the family home and the repossession of the furniture, Thierry moved the family to Oxford and forced them to work, with all of their wages going directly to him. Christine de Vedrin, the wife of Charles Henry, managed to escape when her boss met Thierry and sensed that something wasn't quite right. With the help of her manager, she was able to get back to France and reported the whole ordeal to French authorities. Following a lengthy investigation, Thierry Tilly was arrested and sentenced to serve just eight years in prison for arbitrary detention. The Davidrine family are now without their ancestral family home and are struggling to make ends meet. Christine de Vedrine told Business Insider, quote, Eight years is a small price to pay for what he did to our family. The trial is behind us and we will do everything to rebuild. Number 1 Bernie Teed was a mortician in the small town of Carthage, Texas. With a population of around 6,700 people, Carthage was a tight-knit community and everyone knew Bernie through his line of work. In tough times, Bernie was there for the community and ensured that their loved ones received a thoughtful and dignified send-off. So in 1997, when he was arrested in connection with the disappearance of 81-year-old Marjorie Nugent, the whole community was shocked. In 1990, Marjorie Nugent laid her husband to rest, and it was at her husband's funeral that she met Bernie Teed, who was working as a funeral director. The two quickly became very close despite the 49-year age gap. As Marjorie got older, she needed more assistance and Bernie quit his job and became her assistant and carer in some capacity. Marjorie had also named Bernie as the sole heir to her multi-million dollar estate, which would have influenced Bernie's decision and later actions. For years, the pair traveled together and spent time together. Their friendship blossomed, and they were often seen around town together. That was until November of 1996, when Marjorie mysteriously vanished. Carthage is a small town, and Marjorie's absence was noticed pretty quickly. But Bernie pushed these concerns aside and made up different excuses as to why she hadn't been out and about for a while. What the community didn't know was that Bernie had gotten rid of Marjorie and was storing her remains in a freezer. For nine months, Bernie kept up the charade of being a caring friend 
who was running errands and looking after an ailing old woman. The excuses worked for a while. In mid-1997, Marjorie's friends finally called the Carthage Police Department to request a welfare check. When police searched Marjorie's home, they found her remains inside of a freezer, and Bernie immediately confessed to what he had done. Bernie painted Marjorie out to be an evil woman who controlled him until he snapped. Bernie was swiftly arrested and put on trial, but the trial didn't run smoothly. Despite his open confession, the people of Carthage didn't believe that their beloved Bernie was capable of such an act. After weeks of back and forth arguments, and once the evidence was laid out in front of them, the jury found Bernie guilty and he was sentenced to 50 years in prison. In 2014, Bernie filed a successful appeal, and for years he was able to live his life as a free man. That was until Marjorie's family appealed this decision, which saw Bernie put before a new judge and a new jury. This time, the jury ensured that he would be in prison for the rest of his life, handing down a sentence of 99 years. Bernie Teed continues to file appeals, and he'll next be eligible for parole in 2029. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked this video, be sure to hit that like button. Also, don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell to keep up to date with all of our future uploads. But I've been Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.